Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Daily Press Briefing. I have a short statement to read at the top, and then happy to open it up for questions. The 12th Annual African Growth Opportunity ACT Forum is currently being held in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. It runs from August 9th through 13th. Uh, as many of you know, AGOA is the cornerstone excuse me, of U.S. economic engagement with the countries of sub-Saharan Africa. By providing duty-free access to the U.S. market, AGOA has succeeded in helping eligible sub-Saharan African nations grow, diversify their exports to the United States, and create employment in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, the, this uh, forum will include meetings for the private sector, civil society, and with African Women Entrepreneurs Program participants, followed by a ministerial forum, which begins today. Again, an AGOA enables the 39 eligible sub-Saharan African countries to export <coughs> most products duty-free to the U.S. Total African exports under AGOA have more than quadrupled since the program's inception. Some experts estimate that expanding trade under AGOA is responsible for 350,000 direct and 1 million indirect jobs in Africa, as well as about 100,000 jobs in the United States. In several African countries, AGOA is transformative in diversifying and modernizing economies and workforces. Uh, the discussions will pave the way for the President to work with Congress and other stakeholders on AGOA's extension after September 2015, when the current act is due to expire. Uh, and the U.S. delegation is being led by U.S. Trade Representative Michael Froman. With that, Happy to open it up for Can questions. I ask an off that topic question? You may, yeah. yes. How many unarmed, peaceful, environmental protesters does it take to close down the State Department's main entrance for two and a half hours? Well, Matt, we are aware of the demonstrations that have been taking place here at the State Department today. Uh, of course, we recognize and respect the right to peacefully assemble and express views. I don't have a number for how big the protests were. Uh, as we've mentioned before, we consider input and feedback from the public to be an important part of the review process, uh, which is why we've hosted a public meeting on this in Nebraska in March and are working to incorporate more than 1.2 million public comments into our final supplemental environmental impact statement. Well, I'll get to the policy issue, uh, the policy question mm -hmm. in a second. This wasn't a policy question, though. I don't, more in, about in terms of a number of protesters, I don't have an estimate for what the group was today. Well, it was roughly a little over 100, maybe. Okay. Um, I'll take a your smaller word for it. number would still have caused the massive uh, presence from DHS. I guess there would still have, would still have caused the same security, uh, same security situation. Whereas where Twenty Second Street was blocked, where there were barricades put up in front of the uh, in front of the driveway on the C Street entrance, where there were more than seventy that I counted armed guards. Well, I don't have details for you uh, on what our specific security posture looked like uh, in, in response to the demonstrations. Again, we respect the right of peace, peaceful protest, as these people were, but uh, we also have responsibility uh, for the security of the building and uh, I'm sure, you know, acted uh, com appropriately in, in taking whatever steps we felt were necessary. It, 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 okay, so does that mean that the State Department is not able or doesn't think that it's able to protect its or to secure its own building without the all. help of other agencies? Well, then why were there... Not at all. Why, can, can you explain or can you take the question as to why it was deemed necessary? Were you expecting these people to be violent? Uh, not to my knowledge. It's my understanding that U.S. government facilities around town, when there are uh, mm -hmm. protesters or demonstrations, take additional uh, precautions uh, out of an abundance of caution. I don't think this is a particularly same, unusual. Presumably the same thing would happen overseas at embassies. I wouldn't want to like equate right. the two in any way. So, I, I think this is comparable to what our response would be for any yeah. government facility. Okay. Yeah. You don't think it was a bit of an over, over, overreach? No. I do. Um, to the policy then. Mm -hmm. um, so what's, is there any update on when the, um, when the review will be done? No timeline. Uh, right now we are uh, incorporating, again, the more than 1.2 million public comments into what will be the final supplemental environmental impact statement. Uh, we uh, are doing this in a rigorous, transparent, and efficient manner, uh, but no update on timeline. It's just a process that takes a little while to incorporate all of the public comments. Okay, sorry. I meant a rigorous, transparent, and efficient manner. Mm -hmm. Where's the transparency? Well, we uh, post periodically batches of public comments uh, on our website. But that's the transparency of what people have told you in public. Correct, sense, which is so. what we're currently incorporating into. Right, right. But what about the transparency of the actual review? Well, we will release a supplemental 
uh, environmental impact statement when we've incorporated all the public comments. Right. I think transparency refers to a couple of things, but one of which is uh, that the public is able to be a part of the process. We've been transparent about how the process will work, and people are allowed to uh, give us their opinion, and then we will release the p report, and then uh, right. there's a process after that as well. I understand. So, but the transparency refers to once the what, sharing the public comments, and then, but it does not apply to the actual product, the a review that you're working on until it gets released. Is that correct? Well, correct. It's in, it's a it's in draft form. Uh, yeah. Let me double check on the specifics of when we release things publicly and when we don't. Uh, I just want to make sure I have all the facts on this. Okay, I just uh, want correct. to know what, you, what, what, is what you're saying is transparent mm -hmm. about this. Thank you. Yep, but let me double check again on when we release. If, if we release drafts or not, I'm just not positive. Can we change topic? Can I <coughs> change topic yes, to, we can. Uh, the Palestinian-Israeli talks. Mm -hmm. um, we see an announcement uh, gosh, was it yesterday uh, regarding the, um, the re proposed release of the prisoners, but at the same time, the Israelis moved forward on Sunday to build um, 1,200 homes for Jewish settlers. Doesn't this go against what, what, first of all, does this compromise the talks at all? Well, we feel strongly uh, that the best way to resolve differences between the two parties is at the negotiating table. That's why Ambassador Indyk uh, and his team are in the region right now. Uh, that's why we're having another round of talks this week. Uh, both sides have committed to pursue continuous negotiations, and we have encouraged them to remain focused on the ultimate goals uh, of a permanent agreement. And that's why we will continue to engage with both sides to make concerns known when we have them, but also to work uh, to keep them at the table, talking as they've committed to doing. But does the building of the settlement, uh, does the building of these, these new homes, and if they are new, these are not pre-announced mm -hmm. ones, does that not compromise or that does that, is that not a... Um, a dent in, in confidence building measures ahead of discussions. Well, these announcements that you're referring to certainly come at a particularly sensitive time uh, with the negotiations continuing in the region. Uh, we continue to engage with the uh, Israeli government to make our serious concerns known. Uh, we again stress to them how important it is for the parties to take steps to create a positive atmosphere for talks, as we have seen recently in other moves by both sides, including security cooperation and the decision to release prisoners that you referred to. So we uh, will continue uh, making our concerns known to the uh, Israeli government about that specific issue, yes. Have you asked them to put that on hold? Uh, I'm not going to get into specifics about what those diplomatic discussions uh, entail, other than to say we've made our concerns now. So but you're not you following also... suit with, uh, with European allies who strongly condemned this act as uh, hindering the peace process? Well, I think I just made clear that our position on settlements has not changed, uh, that these announcements do come in a particularly sensitive time, and we have made our serious concerns about this recent announcement known to the government of Israel. Okay, but it, because in the statement, the European Union statement also states very clearly that the settlements uh, are contrary to international uh, uh, laws and, uh, in fact, an obstacle to peace. Do you concur with that? Well, I'm not going to comment on their statement. I'm going to make clear what our position is, but which is that, let me finish, which mm -hmm. is that uh, it has not changed. We do not accept the legitimacy of continued settlement activity. That hasn't changed. And again, we've raised the concerns, these concerns with the government of Israel. Our focus has been uh, getting both parties to the table, which they are now, to talk about the whole range of issues that are on the table. Nobody's naive that these conversations uh, won't be difficult at times, uh, but that's exactly why we have our team there on the ground to help facilitate these discussions. So you don't find this particular uh, announcement to be particularly disturbing being on, uh, on the eve of the resumption of the talks in Jerusalem? Well, I think I was clear that these announcements come at a particularly sensitive time and that we've raised serious concerns with the government of Israel. I think that statement should speak for itself. Okay, and, yes, uh, and today, to, let me just follow up. Uh, today, uh, Martin and Dick met with Mahmoud Abbas. Could you tell us what the content of their meeting was? Well, uh, you are correct that um, Ambassador Indyk is in the region right now. He's having a number of meetings to help facilitate uh, these negotiations. He's accompanied by Deputy Special Envoy Frank Lowenstein. Uh, I think uh, one thing's important to point out at this point, now that we're starting additional rounds of talks that don't involve the Secretary, that I think it's important to set expectations. We won't be reading out every single individual meeting that happens on the ground. As you can imagine, some of them are scheduled on the fly. It's very fast moving. So we'll update you uh, as progress is made, as big meetings are held. But there will be a variety of, of, of meetings that Ambassador Indyk has uh, throughout the coming days. And we're not going to read out every single one of them. But given the context of uh, mm -hmm. these announcements being made, I mean, you basically had the Palestinians threatening on Sunday evening to just walk out even before 
the meetings start, mm -hmm. then we're right back to where we were in 2010. Given that the embassy has already made it clear in the past several days that the U.S. does not approve of these settlements, what has the Secretary himself done? Well, I don't have anything to read out for you about the Secretary's activities. As you know right now, he's in Colombia and Brazil tomorrow. Uh, he's obviously very engaged on this topic, as we all have talked about many times in this room. Uh, Ambassador Indic is on the ground right now, uh, working with both parties. We expect uh, fully the next round of talks to occur on the 14th in Jerusalem. And uh, that's exactly why we think people should come back to the negotiating table, because that's the place to hash out these really difficult issues. Uh, and that's the place where ultimately we can get some resolution to them. With all due respect, yes, the Secretary may be on travel in mm -hmm. Latin America, but there is a phone on his 757. There and is. He, and it would seem that given that uh, the Prime Minister was indisposed over the weekend, that uh, something from the Secretary should have been conveyed to his government about the particular delicacy of the moment. Well, I don't have any specifics for you on at what level we've expressed our concerns to the government of Israel on this issue. Clearly, the Secretary is deeply involved with our team in discussions about how we're going to address some of these issues going forward. Uh, but I don't have any specifics for you on calls the Secretary has made. I can check into that and see if there's anything additional to share. Let me just follow yes. up on this. Since you talked about sensitive time and mm -hmm. you both asked both sides to refrain from taking any provocative action. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the Israeli action now is a slap in the face in your efforts to try to bring the two parties together? Well, I'm not going to characterize it in those terms. I well, think why I th not? Because but I'm not going I to. I think I've made clear that we have serious concerns, and we've raised those with the government of Israel. I think you're right. The Secretary has stressed that both sides uh, should refrain from taking actions that could possibly undermine trust. But the other thing that he's repeatedly emphasized is that clearly there are difficult issues. Clearly there are going to be bumps in the road. But these discussions are taking place privately for a reason, because they are so difficult that the most chance we have for success is not to play them out in public. It's not to have these discussions in public. It's to have the two parties sitting down face to face talking about them, which is exactly what they're going to be doing on the 14th. So you're still hoping that this action, sorry, I was, Go ahead, so, so you're still hoping that this action by the Israelis still will not undermine the peace, uh, the negotiation, and the Palestinians will go along with it? Well, That's clearly, clearly we believe that uh, the two parties are at the table acting in good faith right now. Uh, the Ambassador and Dick and his team is on the ground working with them, uh, and, and we're continuing on our path uh, with the two sides to, to eventually hopefully reach a final status agreement. So we are moving forward with our plans. We've always said there will be uh, difficult times. There will be bumps in the road. If this were easy, it would have been done decades ago. Uh, the fact is we are where we are today, and we're going to continue facilitating between the two sides. So you well, think you can the that. are acting I'll get to in you. good faith? Go I mean, you just said uh, they're acting both. Are acting in good faith. I'm asking you, are the Israelis acting in good faith? We, the Secretary has made clear that both of the negotiating teams are at the table acting in good faith. We've also today made clear uh, that we have serious concerns with this recent announcement. So we're going to move forward towards uh, the meetings on the 14th, and we'll update you as necessary uh, from there. I guess the problem is that they're not at the table at the moment, so I don't know why. How, well, right? Ambassador I mean, Indic is meeting with both sides, and his mm -hmm. team is meeting with both sides right now. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a meeting scheduled for the 14th, so we have so a meeting it, coming it, up. So the answer to Saeed's question, when he asked if you believe that they're both still acting in good faith, your, your answer is yes, you do believe that they are both. Yes, both we, sides we believe both good sides good are at the negotiating table uh, in good faith. And on the 14th, we will have another round of discussions and then go from there. Well, but what, okay, can you explain what, in good faith, meaning what? That they're. That both that they sides both understand side? that, that, that peace is imperative, that this is a goal worth working for, even though it's difficult. Uh, and that that's why you saw them standing here with the secretary just a few weeks ago saying exactly those things. But you, but you, you say that you're concerned about, you have serious concerns about this mm -hmm. announcement and they come at a particularly sensitive time and at a time when you're asking both sides to create the positive atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Do you not think that this undermines the positive atmosphere? Again, whatever, the whatever positive atmosphere there was? Well, again, I, I don't want to characterize it in that way. I've said, and I will continue to say, we have serious concerns. Because this is a particularly sensitive time, what we're focused on is our team working with both sides and saying, right. okay, what are we going to discuss on the 14th? What are those discussions going to look like? Uh, these things aren't mutually exclusive. 
uh, we can do both at the same time, which I think is what you're seeing right now. Well, yeah, but the, well, I guess the, the, the question is, though, that you said that you think that the, the, these issues need to be negotiated between the parties themselves mm -hmm. at the table. But this isn't a problem that the, just the Palestinians have with the Israelis. This is a problem that you have with the Israelis, that the Europeans have with the Israelis, that everyone but some in Israel have with the Israelis. Well, again, so, I'd make so outside of the context of the closed door, super secret mm -hmm. talks, which no one's ever going to talk about, this is an issue that, that 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 you can address and that needs to be addressed. Well, I would say two things, Matt. The first is that our position has not changed. Our U.S. government policy has not changed uh, on right, settlements. Right. Yes. So that's. A in column A. In column B is the work that Ambassador Indic and his team on the ground is working uh, on the ground to facilitate discussions between the two sides about all of these thorny issues that are on the table. So again, those two things aren't mutually exclusive. They clearly know what our policy is, but there's a reason we want both sides at the table, because ultimately uh, it's in both of their interests to discuss and eventually agree on the outcome of these issues between the two of them. It's okay. Um so what what did what do you tell the Israelis then, other than saying we have serious concerns about this because it, it comes at a particularly sensitive mm -hmm. time? Do you just say are you still willing to 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 be at the table? What do you t to ask the Palestinians? Are they still willing to be there? And well, to the best of your knowledge, the answer is yes. I'm not going to detail specific diplomatic conversations beyond what I've already said. But clearly, Ambassador Indic is there meeting with both sides, uh, working on what this next round of talks is going to look like on the 14th, and, and making all of this uh, known to both sides as we go into the 14th. But if one side continually does things, does, takes actions that you disagree with, and has been doing so for years and years and years, even knowing full well your position on it, you don't believe that that undermines any kind of uh, uh, positive atmosphere that might have existed after the first after the first round. I, I'm not going to characterize it in those ways. I would also actually point out to you, I, I'm not going to characterize it in that way. But I will point out to you that the Israeli government uh, is also taking a very difficult but necessary step uh, in part of the peace negotiations to release a number of prisoners as so, well. So that's a good thing that contributes to the positive atmosphere. Well, we correct? think that it demonstrated a willingness by the prime minister to make tough decisions when he determines it's in the best interest of the Israeli people. So, so again, this is a process. Right. So that contributes to the positive atmosphere. Uh, I'm not going to detail what contributes to a positive atmosphere and what doesn't. Well, either it does, does or it doesn't. Well, and something, we, an action either does contribute or it doesn't or it's neutral. Well, it has no effect. The world isn't that black and white. I'm well, saying we have serious concerns about this latest announcement yeah. of settlements. Period. And you don't think that it has any, it doesn't do anything to affect the atmosphere around the next round of talks? I'm not going, I mean, Ambassador Indic is meeting with both Why sides. Why are you, if you're willing to praise the Israelis for mm -hmm. releasing the prisoners, and you're willing to say that you have concerns with mm -hmm. them, surely you can say that that's going to have some kind of, I mean, maybe the two, uh, what, each other, maybe they come out, maybe this is a zero-sum game. Maybe the two, in your opinion, the administration's view, cancel each other out, and so there's a, there's a, the, the net impact is, is, is nothing. I think I would refrain from trying to game one against the other. I think this is a topic, and these negotiations include a variety of very complicated issues. Not just one, not just two, not just ten, but a number of them. Are right? Let me finish. And then, of course, we are doing everything we can to create a positive atmosphere between both sides. That's why uh, they're both working with us. That's why Ambassador Indic and his team are meeting with both sides right now. We're going to express our concerns uh, when we have them. We're going to say the sides are doing things uh, that we think are necessary and positive when we feel that way. But you won't, you won't, but you won't, you won't go after them if you do think they do take actions that are negative. I, I don't and, think and, I. Can, I mean, and, I don't see what's not clear about saying we have serious concerns and we've raised them with the government. Well, of Israel I just don't understand why action. you can't make the the leap between saying that you have serious concerns mm -hmm. and saying that you're concerned about the effect of the talks. Now, may, maybe you're not concerned, but. We Come are planning to that. have the next round of talks on the 14th. Right. Clearly, and, these are delicate issues, but I'm uh, going to use then let me the just word ask serious about concerns. The, let, let me just ask about the, um, and this will be it for me, mm -hmm. um, you, on the long-stated position, we do not accept the legitimacy of, of, of settlements. Um, does that, is that a synonym for saying that you believe that settlement activity is illegal? Uh, I'm going to state our position exactly as I said it. We do not accept the legitimacy of continued settlement activity. Okay, the word, I'm not going to further parse it for you. Um, does you don't Period. you don't know I'm not going to further parse it for you. You don't know the definition of the I'm word not legitimacy. Going, I'm not going to further parse it for you, Matt. Are you suggesting that the 
release of these 26 prisoners uh, slated for Tuesday in any way mitigates the government's decision to go ahead and authorize this? Because certainly that is, no. you know, what uh, some of the survivors of those who were killed by those who are in prison are suggesting. Uh, and to mitigate what, excuse me? Uh, to mitigate uh, the decision to go ahead and authorize these new settlements. No, I, I'm not going to characterize it that way. Uh, I'm not going to speak for the government <clears throat> of Israel or why they've decided to take certain actions at one time or another. That's really for them uh, to discuss. But I'm going to, when again, when we think things uh, are helpful and necessary, uh, we'll say so. But I, I don't want to compare one to the other or do a zero-sum game analysis of, of these two specific incidents. Are separate, in your opinion, correct? I mean, the prisoners issue and the settlement issue are completely separate. Well, they're both part of uh, discussions about how to move forward with the peace process. So, of course, they're not completely separate. They're both part of a discussion about the peace process. Right. But each one, on its own merit, is separate because these prisoners were supposed to be released back in 1993. Many of them. In terms of whether they're separate, there are separate okay. government decisions by the government of Israel. That's my understanding. Again, you'd have to talk to the government of Israel for them to explain why they made these decisions at what time. And I'm not going to go into the history okay. about prisoner releases or I who was released that's when. That's Again, we're talking about today, uh, where we are now uh, in August, and we're saying that this is a difficult but necessary step at this time. Okay. Uh, do you think, does the State Department think mm -hmm. that um, 26 Palestinian prisoners is enough of a confidence-building measure to get the start, uh, to get the talk started. Well, I wouldn't want to put a specific number, a threshold, or a bar. Uh, as we've said, I, I think this. Well, this, we believe that this did demonstrate a willingness by the prime minister to make a tough decision, and that this is a difficult but necessary step to give peace negotiations a chance. And we do believe that it's a positive step uh, forward, and that and that it uh, shows that the government of Israel is uh, investing in the success of the Palestinian Authority as a partner for peace. Again, those are positive steps as part of this process. Um, and then with the, um, with the settlements, um, after what happened on, at the end of the weekend, has the U.S. asked Israel to stop? I'm not going to outline specific uh, diplomatic conversations other than, the, other than to say that we have serious concerns and we'll continue to raise them. Does the, the, the department uh, uh, <coughs> notice a pattern that every time there is a high-level visit or every time there is a negotiation, the Israelis seem to accelerate the process settlement? Do you concur with that Well, Well, Sayyid, I'm not, I'm not going to play historian up here. We've all uh, watched this process play out in various ways throughout the decades. And I'm not going to make a sweeping generalization about how it's played out in the past. What we're focused on right now is how it's going to play out in the future. You don't see the, a pattern that every time there's something like this, the Israelis, perhaps to placate their constituencies, there's a, uh, an announcement of settlement activities or increased activities? Again, I'm, not, I'm not going to use those terms. I'm not going to do a historical look at what has or hasn't happened uh, in the past with these negotiations. We're focused on what's happening now, on how we can continue to build trust between both sides and move forward with the discussions. Yes. Mr. Mark Gregg, I've told reporters on Sunday that this new development is already on land that is going to be part of a final agreement between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Is he telling the truth? Has he told the U.S. or has the Israeli government told the U.S. that is indeed what is happening here? I haven't seen those specific comments, so I wouldn't want to comment on those specifically, uh, other than to say that all of discussions about those issues are being held in private. Um, they're ongoing. I wouldn't want to get ahead of the process that's currently ongoing discussing those issues. But again, I haven't seen those comments, and I wouldn't want to comment on them. You're saying, wait, wait, you're saying that U.S. and Israel are having private discussions about the scope and placement of settlement? New settlements? No, that's not at all what I said. I said I hadn't seen the comments, and I couldn't. Well, you I said, said all this, of the discussions. All of those discussions right now between both all parties involved, us and both sides, are about a broad spectrum of issues, including, of course, this one. But so, I haven't seen those comments and can't comment on them one so way. So the yet. U.S. is consulting or talking to Israel about the, the where and the size, where and when they put settlements? I did not in any way say that. Clearly, we're talking. Uh, let, me, let me finish. I'm trying to find out what, you, what it actually was Clearly, you said. Clearly, we're talking to both sides about the issues that will have to be discussed as part of uh, a final status agreement. Clearly, this is one of those issues. Marie. I, I'm not sure what's not clear is, about that. Once there, once there, well, the question is whether you're talking to the Israelis about their settlements. About, I, I said about we've where, raised our serious yeah, concerns Yeah, yeah, concern saying, that. you know, we don't think it's a good idea, you mm -hmm. shouldn't do that. That's what you're saying. 
but it sounded as if from your answer to Roz that, that you're talking about more, you're talking about specifics, like maybe it would be okay to put some here, well, because that might be, that looks like land that you're going to get a, a, as a result of a final agreement. Well, clearly, as part of the discussions that are happening on the ground between us and both parties, we are discussing the host of issues and how they each might play out as part of an eventual st final status agreement. It should be no surprise that we would talk about possible eventualities with both sides. That's why we're there facilitating. Yes, but the a whole idea of a final agreement with the, was that, is that well, one of the whole ideas of it is that once you get one, there won't be any complaints about settlements anymore because all the land will have been spoken for and Which divided up. Which is why up. we think it's so important to get a final status agreement done. Right, but... Exactly. But he made it sound, <laughs> when he spoke to CBS News, that this was already a fait accompli. The settlements? Yeah. I, I can't speak for the government of Israel or where they are in the process for this announcement. Again, I've said we have serious concerns with it, but I really can't speak uh, to where the process on any new settlement activity in, in is. In, your, in, in one of your, your answers to Leslie, you said that the, the prisoner release was a positive step mm -hmm. in the context of the talk. Now, why can't you say that the settlement announcement is a negative step in the context of the talk? Because I'm choosing the words that I want to use, and I'm saying that we've raised our serious concerns with it. So, so and you, I said that does not mean that it's a negative I'm not, I'm not. I don't understand why you're so afraid to criticize them. It's not that I'm afraid to criticize them, Matt. It's because I'm using well, certain words uh, because I think that they're important to use them in a certain context. Right. We have serious concerns, and I'm not going to go any further, and I'm not going to use the words you want me to use. Well, I'm going to use the words that I think are appropriate. So, uh, besides you're, you're yes. are you at least disappointed? <laughs> are you at least disappointed that the Israelis decided to do this? At this particular sensitive time, I'm not going it? to characterize it any other way than but I already have. You have in the past expressed concerns. disappointment. You don't express disappointment this time around. I don't know why everybody's trying to get me to use different words. I've been clear. We have serious because concerns. Because we want you to show that you are at, at least a little bit disappointed or outraged. Or I don't know what else you think serious concerns would mean. On the, on the use of the words, you, ta you talked about how the prisoner release is difficult and necessary uh, mm -hmm. for uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. Mm -hmm. So those are words that you're deliberately choosing to use, and you're deliberately choosing not to say that the settlements are problematic or, uh, or negative in terms of the environment and peace process. Is that correct? Am I correct? I think you're correct in assuming that words I use up here I, I use for deliberate reason all the time. Yes. Okay, so you are deliberately choosing not to say that the settlement, uh, settlement announcement has a negative uh, that you believe it has a negative impact on I am deliberately on, on choosing atmosphere. to say that we have serious concerns with this announcement, mm -hmm. particularly given the timing, and that we will be raising this with the government of Israel going forward, and we already have done so. I think mm -hmm. that's a very clear statement that we have it concerns is. about It is, and this. so is praising the Prime Minister for a difficult and Absolutely. necessary... Uh, Absolutely. Person. Yes. One, one, one thing. Yes. Yeah, go ahead, Michelle. I'll ask. Yeah, you. Um, just <clears throat> to elaborate on this mm -hmm. meeting between the secretary and the Muslim leaders on Friday regarding mm -hmm. the peace process. Yeah. Um, was it trying to shore up support from within the Muslim community in the United States or the equivalent to a meeting with the Jewish community? What was the purpose? Well, we put out a readout of both, and if you didn't get it, I'm happy to send it around. Uh, I, both meetings were uh, designed, they were with Secretary Kerry and National Security Advisor Susan Rice, uh, to update both communities on the progress we've made in uh, the resumption of final status negotiations. Also, uh, with a recognition that both of these communities have long uh, been involved with peace process issues, play a key role uh, in the United States and in the region. Uh, with their constituencies on these issues. So uh, we'll continue to engage with them going forward, but this was part of the Secretary's uh, and the White House's outreach uh, as part of this effort, yes. And if you didn't get the readout, we can send okay, it around. Please, yes. Uh, one more on uh, the yes. post two. What are the topics that they will be discussing on Wednesday in the first round of discussions? Refugees, security, borders? I, I don't think I have specific topics, and we may not be able to give specific topics. Again, Secretary Kerry has been clear that we're going to be uh, private uh, with what we're discussing. Uh, I don't have anything to announce at this point. If I do tomorrow, I can uh, do it then. Thank you. Any yes. Any topics? Um, on topic? Egypt, I, I want to... Has uh, um, Deputy Secretary Burns decided to go back to Egypt at all? Uh, where do the discussions and the mediation stand on, on trying to resolve the crisis in Egypt? Well, no update on any travel to announce. Uh, as you know, he just returned uh, late last week from his trip to Egypt. Uh, we're continuing to engage with all parties to uh, push towards uh, an inclusive democratic process. Uh, we're continuing uh, to talk to everyone on the ground about it. Our diplomats on the ground are as well. But I don't have any update for you on other uh, high-level engagement. Egyptian 
Egyptian authority decided to extend the detention of former President Morsi for another 15 days. Do you see this as part of a judicial process, or do you see it as a politically motivated? Well, uh, our position on this hasn't changed. We continue to call for an end to all politically motivated uh, arrests and detentions and uh, emphasize that this won't help Egypt move beyond the crisis. Our position has not changed. Yes, Joe. Other subject? Okay. Yes, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Back here. Yes, in uh, the last time you anybody talk about what's going on in Egypt was last Thursday. So Friday, Saturday, Sunday, mm -hmm. and I can say even Monday because it's the end of the day over there. Any contacts, any communication, any kind of consulting with each other or something going on in the last four days? Um, well, I don't have any uh, readouts of communications as diplomatically to, to give to you today. Clearly, our folks uh, are, are very engaged on the ground and in Washington uh, with the different parties to help move them back towards a political uh, uh, process that's inclusive and democratic, uh, but no updates on, on engagement. So there is another thing which is related mm -hmm. to this uh, sit-ins in Rabba and Nahda, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, still people over there, I mean, I, as much as we are, is reported, they are talking about reinstating President Morsi as the president of, Uni of uh, <laughs> Egypt. Do you have anything about this? Well, uh, it's up to the Egyptian people to decide what their government looks like going forward. We've repeatedly made clear that it's not for us to decide. It's up for them to decide. So uh, what we've emphasized is what we've always emphasized, that there needs to be an inclusive democratic process going forward. What the makeup of that eventually looks like isn't for me to, or anyone else in the U.S. government, to uh, predict. It's if, if, let's say, the, the, the Egyptian authority, or the, let's say now who are in charge of Egypt, Mm -hmm. in order to be more specific, mm -hmm. decided to disperse or whatever they call it, get rid of these uh, uh, sit-ins. Mm -hmm. At that time, I'm expect, I, I, do we have it to expect that you are going to say Egyptians are going to make their own decisions? Well, in terms of that specific question, we've repeatedly made clear that the Egyptian authorities have both moral and legal obligations uh, to respect the rights of individuals to peacefully assemble. Uh, we are especially concerned, uh, very deeply concerned today about the potential for violence uh, in Egypt. We've obviously seen these reports, and from the start, we've emphasized to those within Egypt that violence only sets back the eventual cause that uh, they claim to be working for and need to uh, allow people to protest peacefully. Yes, another thing which is, which is related to U.S. Mm -hmm. role and participation, quote-unquote, interference in Egyptian affairs, as it was described by all these demonstrations, both sides even, mm -hmm. and uh, I assume that that the front page story of Wall Street Journal on, fri on Friday was really explaining in details all these things. And in the right, in the last two days, there are more coming out of Egypt regarding whether it's Patterson, whether it's expected uh, f uh, Ambassador Ford or whoever is there. Uh, is there any steps taken? to, let's say, if it's not improving the relation, at least improve the image? Well, I think Jen has said this repeatedly, that the best antidote to the false information that we're taking sides or that we're too uh, involved uh, in, in ways we shouldn't be is to get the facts out there. And Ambassador Patterson and our folks here uh, have made it clear, including Deputy Secretary Burns, that our role is to help facilitate. It's to assist them in any way uh, that would be helpful to bring the sides together, to get people on the same page, to help uh, quell violence, and eventually to get back to a democratic process. So we can, we're going to keep saying uh, the same thing to try to dispel some of, some of these rumors. Yes, I, I just want to, because mm -hmm. it's like uh, I asked the same question on Wednesday or Thursday, as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. and uh, I almost get the same answer. Well, I mean, that's because we have the same message, and that I, hasn't no, changed. I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to get a different uh, message. You know, I'm just trying to figure out what does this message means. Well, the message means that we don't take sides. We're not going to decide what the future of Egypt's government looks like. We will work with all parties and all groups. We will encourage them to come to the table as part of an inclusive process that eventually leads back to sustainable democracy. And we are going to keep repeating that message uh, as long as we have to, because it's an important one. And the last one, I hope it's the last one, and uh, <laughs> thank you for your patience. Of course. Uh, it's related to word in misinformation. I still, I feel, you know, it's in old days when we were in school that when you say something, you heard something, we say 
give me examples. What kind of misinformation you are talking about? Well, I think some of it's some of what you've alluded to that uh, there's there's different information about whether the U.S. government is taking sides, uh, whether we think one party or one group or one person should eventually be part of this new government. You've mentioned some of the comments about our diplomats serving there. Um, but we're just trying to make clear that that's not the case and that's not the truth and trying to convey to people what our policy actually is, which is to work with everyone uh, as part of an inclusive process. A statement about the uh, concern mm -hmm. that this building has today about the potential for violence. Mm -hmm. Why shouldn't we find it curious that there hasn't been any contact between this government and the Egyptian government that you're able to read out over the past four days? Well, I don't. I wouldn't assume that there hasn't been any contact. I just don't have any read out for you. The secretary, as you know, has been very engaged with this. I believe he has made some calls related to this. I can uh, endeavor to get a, a list to, to give to you after the briefing. And uh, rest assured that our diplomats on the ground are in constant contact with the interim government and with all parties. So don't assume that there's a lack of contact. I just don't have any specifics to read out from here. Would it be uh, fair to assume that uh, the message is going through don't crack down Absolutely. on the demonstrations? Absolutely. Don't do it. If there's too much at risk if you do so? We've consistently said that demonstrators need to be able to uh, protest peacefully and that this is a pivotal time for Egypt that uh, it's a crucial time, that everybody needs to act as, as if it is a crucial time and act accordingly and not take steps that would take Egypt towards more political polarization or worse, violence, but back in the other direction towards a democratically elected government. What happens if they don't listen to the U.S. government? Well, again, I'm not going to uh, predict what, kind, what, what that would mean, but our, our point isn't that they should listen to the U.S. government because it's in our interests. It's because it's in the people of Egypt's interests that they represent, uh, that they are tasked with leading, that uh, the new government will be tasked with leading. And so it's in the, it's in the best interest of their own people. Not in the U and it's not for us to decide what the process looks like, uh, or who's part of that, excuse me. It's in the interest of the Egyptian people to get back towards that process. Can I, uh, just mm -hmm. in the answer to the very first question on Egypt yeah. about uh, former President Morsi, you mm -hmm. said you continue to call for the end uh, to all politically mm -hmm. related detentions. I just want to check to make sure that that you that you believe that his detention is politically motivated. Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, and then the when you say when 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 you say that your message or when you try to be clear about your message mm -hmm. going to the Egyptians and that. You mentioned the misinformation and disinformation. Mm -hmm. um, are, are you concerned at all that the message that you're not taking sides it has been compromised by the fact that you essentially did take a side by not calling what happened a coup? Well, I would disagree with that assessment, Matt. We uh, made a determination. Let me, let me finish. We made a determination uh, that we did not have to uh, make a determination one way or the other, that we weren't going to either A, call it a coup, or B, say that it wasn't. So there were three options that could happen here. One, the other two options, which we didn't take, I think many of us would argue, uh, would have been seen as taking one side or the other. Up until that day that you did that, there had never been a third option. There were only the two options. So you basically invented the third option. But then when you, but do you can see, do you, can you understand why your message is not getting through or why there is some confusion over the message because of that. Well, I don't want to... Uh, or do you, do you think that the, the Egyptian popul pop public should be fully informed of the nuance of all of your decisions? Because for most people, it's either a, it, it is a black and white thing. And when you choose a third gray path. A third option that deliberately was meant not to, to make it appear as if we weren't taking one side or the other, because let's take a step back. If, hypothetically, we had just made a determination the other way and said, officially, we're not calling this a coup, which was option B, then the other side would have thought we were taking sides. So, so not, all we can do... So there should be proof, then, that your, 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 your decision, your policy should be proof to the, skeptic, to the confused Egyptian people that I think you're this not is certainly sides. one data... Is that, I, yes, I think this is certainly one data point. I think uh, the other data points include public comments uh, at many levels of this government, including from this podium, repeatedly, that we are not taking sides, that we will meet and work with all parties going forward. Yes. 
Yes. Other subject. Oh. One more. <laughs> One more. Sorry, uh, I thought she was going to come on. The, the fact that we haven't seen any sign of a resolution of, of Deputy Secretary Burns going back or mm -hmm. the EU or anyone, anyone else, that, uh, you know, that leaves you with the impression that these talks have, that the mediation and the talks have failed and that this is just a period of waiting now. Well, I wouldn't want to use that term. I think everybody's been clear uh, that this is a very difficult process. And we have been clear that the time for dialogue has not passed. We want to make that crystal clear, uh, that this is an ongoing process, that the time for dialogue is still open, and uh, that these are very complicated issues. There's a lot of political polarization. We're all very well aware of that. And that's why we want to continue to play a facilitating role and to help bring all the parties uh, together. But again, I would stress that uh, the time for dialogue has in no way uh, ended just because Deputy Secretary Burns returned to Washington last week. In fact, it's actually the opposite. What, what are they waiting for? What is who waiting for? Uh, the mediators. Uh, I mean, obviously, there are some steps that they're waiting for to be taken, or they're waiting for the Egyptians to make a decision on which way they want to go. What, what exactly... Well, I think uh, we made this clear last week that we have, we're encouraging certain comp confidence building measures, and we outlined some of this, them last week, but I'm happy to go over them again. Um, no, I got, I got the okay, well, some yeah. of them, just for folks who weren't here, uh, include things like public statements condemning violence, uh, commitment to meaningful negotiations. There's a number of confidence building measures that uh, we're working on all sides to agree to, but again, this is a very complex, difficult situation. Uh, nobody thinks this would be easy. Uh, but our goal remains the same, and we're going to keep continuing to work with all parties to help achieve that. Thank you. On Egypt still? No. Okay, just one second. We'll go here and then back there. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the head of al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, Abu Basir al Haishi, has addressed a message to his followers, imprisoned fighters, uh, encouraging them, don't worry, eventually you will get out. Is this raising concern here at the State Department that there could be uh, more prison breaks stirred up by him, and uh, you know what is the risk that he will do that? That he will stir this up? Well, we're, I, we've repeatedly said we're conce concerned. Excuse me about prison breaks. Uh, we've talked about them in, in Yemen before. Uh, so clearly, it's an ongoing concern for us. I would reiterate that we and the government of Yemen work very closely and cooperatively together on counterterrorism issues. Uh, we've been clear uh, that we're going to take steps to protect. Uh, our people or our interests or our facilities from potential threats from AQAP and others. But this is this is basically the guy who, you know, started the prison breaks and then we had all of the embassy closings. So is there a higher level of concern that he's coming out with this statement? Um, I think there's always a high level of concern about this and, and any time there's a high level statement from an Al Qaeda leader uh, like him, clearly it's of concern and our folks take a look at it and 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 analyze what it means and how uh, the threat picture, what it looks like, whether that should change or not. Uh, this is no different, but clearly it's, it's an ongoing serious concern for us. And just to, for the record, is there any update on the uh, closings? So yesterday, uh, on August 11th, um, we reopened, as we said we would, there's no update, but we reopened uh, 18 of the 19 posts that had been closed recently due to this threat uh, emanating uh, for the potential for terrorist attacks from AQAP. Uh, as we said, uh, the embassy in Sana'a remains closed <coughs> because of this ongoing threat, and our consulate in Lahore uh, remains closed as well due to a separate credible threat to that facility. So no update, just reiterating uh, where, where we are uh, and where we were last week. Related to yes. Al-Qaeda, uh, mm -hmm. Al-Qaeda claimed responsibility for a very bloody weekend uh, in Baghdad. Do you have any, anything to say about that in Iraq? Yeah. Yes. When we put out a statement over the weekend, so I'd that, encourage folks yeah. to take a look at it, um, we condemn in the absolute strongest possible terms the cowardly attacks that took place in Baghdad, uh, especially the fact that they were targeting families celebrating the Eid holiday. Uh, these terrorists who committed these acts are enemies of Islam and a shared enemy of the United States, Iraq, and the international community. Uh, we made clear in our statement that most of these attacks have been perpetrated by al-Qaeda in Iraq. Uh, we put out some more information over the weekend about their leader uh, and the uh, reward that we have out there for his, for his capture. But again, I would reiterate what we've said, that a majority of Iraqi people have rejected this kind of terrorist violence and that the leaders of Iraq have been working together uh, along with, with us uh, in a supporting role to help fight this common enemy. So you did express uh, your desire or your intent to shore up uh, Iraq's ability to fight al-Qaeda. What kind of new efforts that you are doing with the Iraqis to do that? 
Well, I don't have anything new to announce for you, and as a general matter, we often don't discuss specifics about counterterrorism cooperation. I will say that we'll continue to work with Iraq uh, to both overcome the threat of terrorism, but also to bring justice uh, to those who continue to perpetrate these crimes. Uh, obviously, these are a, a constant reminder of the challenges that Iraq faces, but we will continue to explore at the same time possible ways to increase our counterterrorism uh, cooperation going forward. Has the Iraqi security force been capable up until this recent wave of bombings of maintaining security inside the country? And along with that, why <coughs> couldn't it be argued that this might be a possible moment for the U.S. to revisit the question? of a status of forces agreement with Iraq to help it stabilize and restore security, particularly in Baghdad? Well, I'd make a couple points. I think the first is that we have seen an, an uptick in recent uh, months in, in Al Qaeda in Iraq and terrorist attacks in Iraq. So uh, we will continue working with the security forces, with counterterrorism cooperation. As uh, Al Qaeda has perpetrated more attacks, clearly um, we will look for new ways to cooperate on counterterrorism. I don't want to uh, venture to, to guess hypothetically what that might look like. Uh, clearly, we have a close relationship with the government of Iraq, and we'll continue working with them, again, to fight this, this shared enemy. What sort of uh, proposals might uh, Secretary Kerry bring to the Foreign Minister, Mr. Zabari, when he visits here on Thursday? Well, I, I don't have any specifics to preview for you. Uh, I'll just give you a quick preview of, of uh, Foreign Minister Zabari's visit. He'll be uh, visiting this week to join Secretary Kerry in co-chairing a meeting of the Political and Diplomatic Joint Coordination Committee under the U.S.-Iraqi Strategic Framework Agreement. This meeting will take place on Thursday morning at the State Department. Uh, Foreign Minister Zabari will also engage with a number of senior State Department officials who will participate in the committee meeting, and then there's a lunch to follow. Uh, I'll have more details on this specifically later in the week. It's been suggested that uh, a lot of this instability has been in large part because of what's happening next door in Syria, mm -hmm. that for all the hell, frankly, that's happening inside Syria, mm -hmm. that uh, AQI is seeing an opportunity to perhaps expand it mm -hmm. into Iraq. Is that something that needs to be looked at again as the U.S. tries to figure out how to mobilize an end to the Syrian civil war? Well, the situation in Syria has clearly uh, fueled tensions in the region. Uh, and foreign fighters, many of whom become suicide bombers, like some of the attacks we've seen in Iraq, are flowing into Syria, and then many more of them are making their way into Iraq. So clearly, there are a number of reasons that we believe a, a political solution to the situation in Syria is imperative. Uh, of course, most importantly for uh, the people of Syria, who are suffering under the brutality of the Assad regime, but also because of the uh, destructive and, and violent impact it's had in other parts of the region, uh, Iraq and elsewhere. So I would underscore that uh, the situation in Syria, we would agree, is having a, a very negative effect on the situation in Iraq. Just related to Syria, there is actually an ad in the metro close to you trying to get your attention mm -hmm. with President Assad wearing a T-shirt that says, I love the U.S. because they're keeping me in my job. What happened to your um, call for him to step down? And do you think this part of the freedom of expression, that people are allowed to do that? Or are you keeping him in, in his well, job? Well, certainly we believe in freedom of expression. Uh, I've seen that ad. Uh, I'd make a few comments. I believe it talks about uh, the Russians and the well, U.S. So let me just make a comment about uh, the Geneva Conference after the 2 plus 2 on Friday. Uh, following the Secretary's meeting on Friday with Foreign Minister Lavrov, both sides agreed that they remain committed to holding a Geneva 2 conference as early as is practically possible. On Friday, both sides also discussed the devastating humanitarian situation on the ground and pledged that their staff would follow up to see what more we can all do to alleviate the suffering inside Syria. Uh, our position on Assad has not changed, that he uh, has lost all legitimacy. He must go. His, it is uh, inconceivable that the regime will be able to uh, regain control, of all, control over all of their territory. So we've made that clear and we'll continue working towards that goal. There were some talks that the conference might take place in October. Is this some date that we can I don't have any by? timeline to announce for you. Uh, the Secretary and Foreign Minister Lavrov agreed as soon as practically possible. Obviously, there are still some logistical issues uh, and substantive issues that are being discussed right now. Uh, but our goal is to move as quickly as possible uh, when we can have a conference that has uh, the best chance to succeed. We're not just having a conference to have a conference. Yes. No subject? No. no. And no one, yeah. It's inconceivable that the Assad that Assad will ever regain 
That the regime? Regime, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, is that because you think that no matter what, that, that this is a military stalemate? I'm, I don't, those two things are a little separate, but go ahead. Mm, no. I mean, why is it inconceivable that... That, that we seriously doubt that the regime would ever have an well, ability? Well, seriously doubt is a bit different than inconceivable. Okay, well, either word you want to use. We're okay. all about parsing words today. I understand that. No, no, no. Um, You're the one who talked about how you deliberate use words very deliberately. So let's. Our, our let's point is why that is it inconceivable? Does that mean that you, does that mean that the U.S. believes that this is a military stalemate that neither side can win on the battlefield? I think those are little separate things, but let me try and take them both. We have been clear that there are going to be gains one way or the other on the ground. I think we've seen some gains for the opposition, actually, in the past few days in different places in Syria as well. So when one side is up or one side is down, I think two, a couple things are clear. One, that Assad has lost all legitimacy in Moscow. Two, that the regime it, uh, will, will be unable to reassert control over all of its territory. And three, the best uh, and we believe only solution to this problem in Syria, to the crisis in Syria, is a political solution. Because we could go, you know, one side up, one side down. There's not going to be a military solution. I'm not going to use the word stalemate, but uh, I will say that we look at a situation on the ground where each side sometimes makes advances, sometimes doesn't, and that's exactly the reason why we need to bring the parties to the table to have a political solution. You do not believe that either side has the ability or mean, means or ability to win decisive military victory. We do not that believe correct? that there's a military solution to the conflict. A, a military a re, a military solution, which means mm -hmm. that's the same thing as saying a stalemate. But this tug of war, this tug of war back and forth could conceivably uh, prolong the regime for, for many years to come, correct? I'm sorry, sir. This tug of war, I mean, the fact that, you know, one day the opposition gains ground and the next day the regime gains ground which, could actually prolong the regime exactly, for many years to come. Which is exactly the reason, it could, it could prolong the crisis for many years to come, right. which is exactly why we have been clear that the longer we go without a political solution, the more suffering the Syrian people endure. And that that's the reason we and the foreign minister from Russia and uh, the UN and our other partners agree that we have to move as quickly as possible uh, to a political solution. Because every day that we don't, every day that we have ups and downs on the ground and fighting and attacks and violence is another day that the Syrian people are suffering uh, at the hands of the Assad regime. Are you prepared to deal with this crisis conceivably for four or five more years to come? I don't want to get into a hypothetical about how, how no, long this might go on. In terms of the magnitude of the humanitarian crisis that may result of this war going on for a long time. Well, we're time. clearly committed to uh, providing humanitarian assistance to the Syrian people, uh, both inside Syria, but also those that have been displaced in neighboring countries, working with those countries to help deal with uh, the influx of refugees that they've taken in. So clearly we're committed to uh, helping with the humanitarian situation uh, as we need to. If both you and the Russians are so sure so convinced that this conference is necessary and crucial to ending the situation. What is the holdup? Well, I think we've talked about some of the issues in this room that we uh, need to decide together with the UN and the Russians. We've been in discussions, as you know, about uh, attendance, about date, about location, about agenda. Uh, we all know that there are some thorny issues that are still being worked for. I'm not going to uh, detail what the current diplomatic discussions are focused on in terms of moving forward with Geneva, but I think we're all aw well aware uh, of the difficult uh, issues that we are discussing in, in the lead up to scheduling Geneva. Right. It, it was to have been held two months ago, wasn't that correct? That was the goal, or original goal? Well, we've said we want to hold June. it as soon as possible. Right. But and we're I not mean, going to do it just to do it. We need to hold it at a time and place when we feel I like understand. it has a chance for but success. I guess what I'm trying to find out is why, mm -hmm. ha why is having it tomorrow, uh, not, why, well, why is that not a... Uh, because there are clearly some outstanding issues that still need to be resolved. I'm not going to get, detail them get, for you. Get into them. I'm not going to detail them for you here. Uh, but there are clearly How some... How about anywhere else? <laughs> I'm not going to detail them for you. At all. Right. Okay. So, so what, so the Syrian people can look to what as the reason that their suffering is continuing? Well, they can look to the Assad regime, first of all. Okay. I would start there. So that they're the problem with this conference. Well, with the conference or with yeah. their, you, you asked me where they can look to about well, their you suffering. Said that, well, you said that, that, that the only way to end this is a, is a political mm -hmm. solution and, right. that, and, that, and that a Geneva conference is crucial to that. Mm -hmm. So I'm just trying, and you say that you and the Russians agree that you have to have this as soon as possible, mm -hmm. and I'm just trying to find out why then, if you both agree, the two main mm -hmm. sponsors of this, 
both agree on this, what it is that's keeping it from happening and that's prolonging the Syrian people's misery. I mean, you're not going to get, it doesn't look like, Assad step in, heeding your call and just leaving power on his own. So well, for, let's, for one example, I will say that, that we've been clear that the formula for a political transition was outlined in the Geneva communique, uh, and that Russia, the UN, the EU, the Arab League, and other countries support it. Uh, the opposition supports this goal. Uh, the, the Assad regime does not. So that's so it's the Assad regime. Clearly, one sticking point here yeah. in moving forward. What about okay. uh, the Russians' refusal <clears throat> to uh, stop giving weapons to Syria? I don't have anything new for you on that. Clearly, we've made our concerns known with the Russian government uh, about their uh, support at times of the Syrian regime, uh, and we'll continue to do so. But I would underscore that in the meeting Secretary Kerry had with Foreign Minister Lavrov, uh, they both agreed that we need to move forward with the Geneva Convention as soon as possible because the situation is so dire and we need to move forward with the process. New subject, New subject or Syria? Oh, Syria, one more. Okay. Uh, just a minute ago, you said that um, the opposition supports this this goal of Geneva II. So, I, can we take it then that um, it's the position of this department uh, that the, uh, the Syrian, the various Syrian opposition groups, are sufficiently organized at this point to effectively participate in uh, Geneva II? Well, I think we've been encouraged by some steps we've talked about. The first, of course was elections of a political leadership. We've talked a lot about how that was a key step towards uh, Geneva II. Again, the details about who might attend and who might not are still being worked out. But broadly speaking, uh, the SOC, uh, which is the body we recognize as the umbrella organization for the opposition politically, uh, is committed to this process, yes. Anything else on Syria? Uh, the, uh, the opposition leader, uh, Al Jarba, has said yesterday or on Thursday that he is working with the Free Syrian Army to form unified armed forces inclusive of all rebels groups. Do you support uh, such, a, such a move? Well, I haven't seen those comments. I think, generally speaking, we've made it clear that the SMC is the overarching uh, military body uh, for the Syrian opposition. I, I'm not exactly sure what specific comments you're referring to, but we will continue working with General Idris uh, going forward. And the uh, Kurdistan uh, region President uh, Barazani has threatened that Iraqi Kurdistan is ready to defend Kurds mm -hmm. uh, living in Syria if it's found that they are being threatened by Al-Qaeda. Uh, how do you view this, uh, this uh, threat? Well, we continue to remain uh, deeply concerned by reports of ongoing clashes between extremists and Kurds following last week's attacks uh, in Aleppo province. Uh, we're aware of uh, the comments by Mr. Barzani and urge all groups to avoid any actions that could exacerbate ten tensions and increase the risk of violence inside Syria and beyond its borders. Uh, we'll continue making the point that overt sectarian provocation cannot be justified and that we condemn any of these attacks that we've seen in Aleppo and elsewhere in the strongest terms. Thank you. Syria? Syria. Syria? Uh, yeah, uh, Jennifer said uh, last week that Ambassador Ford was in London for talks with the Syrian opposition I about unifying Paris, I think Paris, Paris mm -hmm. for, to unify their ranks and have mm -hmm. one uh, um, one representative <coughs> to the Geneva mm -hmm. uh, when it goes on. Any progress on that? Uh, I don't have any update for you on Ambassador Ford's uh, work on this. I can uh, endeavor to see if there's a readout and get back to you if I have anything to share. Thanks. Syria. New topic, Joe. Mm -hmm. um, his father now says that he has a visa. He's going to head for Moscow. He's going to talk with his son ab about uh, defending himself against his charges. Mm -hmm. And there seems to be a little glimmer that maybe they would be open to coming back, you know, in inducing him to come back. Is that how you read it? And is the State Department involved in any type of, you know, discussions with the family? Uh, I don't I don't know the answer to your second question. I will endeavor to find out uh, if we are and get back to you on that. Uh, in terms of the first, we've been clear that Mr. Snowden needs to return to the United States to face the charges with which uh, he's been he faces. Uh, we've also been clear that when he does so, he will be able to make his case in a free and fair trial. I'd advise him, as a matter of fact, not to make a deal with the government of the United States. Are you aware of that? I, I have not seen that report, Saeed. You've seen the comments, though, about but from the father about President Obama, about the U.S. justice system. I mean, they're pretty strong comments. What, what do you say to the father of Snowden? 
Well, I'd make a couple points. That uh, the Attorney General made it very clear in a letter that we sent to the Russian government that when Mr. Snowden returns to the United States, he will face a free, free and fair trial. He, we will not seek uh, the death penalty. Uh, he will uh, not be tortured. We were clear in the letter uh, that he will be afforded uh, his rights under the law as someone charged with very serious crimes. So I think that was made absolutely clear from the U.S. government. And again, uh, his, his chance to make his case is in a court of law uh, where he will face his charges. Promising not to kill or torture someone is hardly the most welcoming way to get, to get him back. Would, would, would his father face any problems uh, with his passport for visiting his fugitive son in, not, uh, not, just in general? Not that uh, I, I mean, know of. In, in, in other cases like this, there's no, there isn't, not, there isn't U.S. Any, passport issues? Yeah. Not that I know of. We don't generally comment on specific no, no, passport but I mean, issues, in general, but I wouldn't go, want to speculate. If you, go to a, if you go to a foreign country, if you use your passport to go to a foreign country mm -hmm. to visit with someone who faces charges back at home, I'm just wondering if there's any possible ramification for uh, The answer is I don't know, but our focus isn't on uh, Mr. Stone's father. It's on him. He's the one that's been charged with very serious crimes, and he's the one that needs to return to the United States uh, to face those crimes as soon as possible. Snowden, are we... Good. New subject, yes. Um, the anger uh, is spreading throughout India and India, in the Indian parliament as far as India-Pakistan relations are concerned. Two prime ministers supposed to meet in New York at the United Nations summit, but it looks like it's just like U.S. and Russia uh, between India and U.S. now. My question is that now the Indian defense minister, Mr. Anthony, is saying that those who killed five Indian uh, soldiers on the border of Kashmir were killed by the Pakistani army, not by the terrorists, Pakistan was saying. And Pakistan is, of course, denying. And what Indians are saying that always Pakistan policies do and deny and then later let the world decide what's the future. My question is, have secretaries spoken with anybody in India or in Pakistan? Because it looks like from a verge of peace, it's maybe coming to the verge of war between the two countries. And remember, Kargil was also took place during Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif that time, which he denied that there is no uh, activities on the border of Kargil, but war took place and thousands died from both sides. Well, I don't have any uh, secretary phone calls to read out for you. I, I'd make a couple points. First, that we're aware uh, of these reports and are concerned about any violence, as we always are, along the line of control. And we continue to press and hope that India and Pakistan will continue the steps they have recently taken to improve their bilateral relations. Uh, beyond that, I don't have anything uh, further except to reiterate what we've always said, that they need to keep taking steps to improve trust and improve their relationship. What the Indian government or Indian officials and also Indian parliamentarians are saying in the Indian Congress, that also among Indian congressmen, that how can you have a peace process and peace talk with the neighbor, with the country, where violence continues and they support the violence on the border and also against India from their soil. Well, we believe, as we always have, that the pace, scope, and character of India and Pakistan's dialogue on Kashmir is for those two countries to determine. Uh, these are discussions that happen in those two countries, among their own two governments, and, and that's the appropriate place for that determination to be made. My question is really uh, that Pakistan should stop terrorism against India, but that's what uh, anger among Indians and among the parliamentarians in the Indian parliament. That is the question. What U.S. is doing about this? Uh, because U.S. is already saying that there is a terrorism problem. There, is a, there are terrorists and core terrorism and core, core ter al-Qaeda and Taliban inside Pakistan, and they are harming a number of countries, including India. Well, I think we're talking about two separate issues here. I'd want to make a distinction between the Kashmir issue, which I've just talked a little bit about, and the broader issue of our concern about extremism in that region. I would uh, emphasize that, that those are two separate issues, uh, and that I think our views on both are well known. There's yes. no Kashmir issue. There's a terrorism issue, really. Again, our position on Kashmir has not changed, and I have no nothing further to add on that. Yes. Yeah, on the same subject. Okay. Uh, See, this thing has gone beyond uh, the LOC, and now there was at least one incident of firing across the international border in Salkut. And there are, if you read the Indian media, you see almost every day appeals by politicians to for a punitive action against Pakistan. And uh, same, the sentiments are not very different in Pakistan. So I have two questions. One is, do you see this actually leading towards a war 
between India and Pakistan, both of them have uh, nuclear weapons. And also, don't you think it's about time for the United States to get more actively involved in preventing a war between two nuclear armed nations? Well, I think you're getting way ahead of where we are today. I don't want to uh, venture a guess hypothetically at what might, as to what might happen next. Uh, I noted that we hope they will continue the steps that we have seen recently to improve their bilateral relations. Uh, of course, we remain concerned about any uh, incidents of violence, and we'll make that clear. But I'm not going to hypothetically venture to guess what, what will happen next. Are you saying that they are, despite the tension, they are still continuing to talk to each other, they engage with each, with each other? I, I don't have updates for you on what the two countries are doing bilaterally. I, I'd refer you to either have of you, them. Have you been involved in persuading them to talk to each other? Have you contacted them? I don't them? have any updates for you on that or any details about uh, communications to read out. Uh, but, yes. but the uh, fighting uh, is not only taking place uh, across the line of control in Kashmir. Uh, the point was that there was an international boundary and eastern Pakistani city of Sialkot, uh, there was firing by the Indian soldiers. And <clears throat> in another part, in Ravla Court in Kashmir, uh, one civilian was killed by the Indian firing. Uh, do you think that India at this time, when Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif uh, offered uh, peace talks, should have responded to his uh, peace overtures this way? I'm not going to do that kind of political analysis from the podium. Uh, again, I will check in with our team on this issue. I know there's a lot of interest in it, and if I have anything additional to add, I'm happy to share that tomorrow at the briefing. Do you think that uh, the jingoistic uh, <clears throat> uh, mode and uh, in the media and Indian politicians, is it uh, uh, harming the prospects of the two prime ministers meeting in New York on the sidelines of UN I summit? I just don't have anything additional for you on this topic. Again, I'm happy to check in with our team, and we can continue the discussion tomorrow. Could you Next just topic. Could, could, could you just take the, the, in, as part of that uh, mm -hmm. part of that question just to find out if it's your understanding, if it's the administration's understanding, based on the conversations that I'm sure that you've had mm -hmm. with the, both sides, whether it's your understanding that the initiatives that the the things that you were talking about the pot reason positive mm -hmm. steps that they're both interested or that they're both willing to continue along those yeah, lines absolutely and i ask that but with the, uh, keeping in mind the mm -hmm. fact that uh, in another i and p situation you have been willing to say mm -hmm. that both sides are still at Operating the table in good faith, in good faith. I will take that as part of Thank the question. You. Again, I know there's a lot of interest in this, and I will endeavor to get more details for you for tomorrow's briefing. Different subject, Different India. subject. But okay. India. Okay. Um, Anna Hazare, the firebrand anti-corruption uh, leader of India, is uh, coming to U.S. this month, and he is addressing um, audiences in New Jersey, in, in Maryland, uh, in San Francisco, everywhere. Uh, is he going to is there going to be any meeting with the u.s administration state department um, with him i i do not know the answer to your question can I you will take, take the, it yeah. and i will and, find out and the second thing yeah. is that um, uh, with the 2014 elections coming in india mm -hmm. uh, are you allowing uh, the indian political parties to bring their political fray on the u.s soil in different ways i'm not sure i understand your question there are political, uh, there are, yes, there are uh, organizations here of which are yes. uh, supporting one or the other mm -hmm. party, and they are, you know, the leaders from India are visiting. So it's a, in, in a way a kind of a proxy uh, war going on here. So do you allow that? Because Constitution, the U.S. Constitution doesn't. Well, we as the U.S. State Department and U.S. government don't take sides and don't uh, pick who we think should be winners of elections. We'll work with whoever the elected uh, winners are uh, at the outcome of that election. But uh, in terms of a U.S. government position, we certainly don't don't take sides. But you allow what them to. Is, they yeah. Should they be allowed to campaign inside the United States for their parties? I, I'm not aware of this specific report. I will add it to the list of questions I need to get an answer to on India, and uh, we can talk about it tomorrow. Just yes, quick Jim. One region, one. Just quick on the region. I'm sorry. Um, there is a $10 million reward against Mr. Hafiz Saeed uh, from the United States, and he is openly in Lahore, is giving speeches against the U.S., and just now recently on Eid at the Gaddafi Stadium in Lahore, he was seen, and according to the press report by Pakistani and Indian reporters, and still U.S. is not uh, after him. And also, uh, Mr. Daud wanted by India, is in Karachi openly. Uh, they are both giving speeches against India and against the U.S. 
Uh, I saw some of those reports uh, from the weekend. Uh, I don't have anything for you on them. I'm, I'm also happy to add that to the list, and we can have a fulsome discussion on all India-related issues tomorrow uh, in the briefing. Jill, you're welcome. Brief, brief one other subject. This American uh, teacher who mm -hmm. was expelled from Bahrain, what can you tell us about her? Yep, let me pull that up. We are aware of the press reports regarding the de deportation of a U.S. citizen from Bahrain. The U.S. Embassy in Manama was not contacted for consular assistance. Due to privacy considerations, uh, I don't have further information at this time and would refer any further questions to the Bahraini authorities, again, because we were not contacted for consular well, assistance. If not contacted, how can there possibly be privacy issues? Because uh, in order for In other words, because you don't know anything about the no, situation. No, no. You you're not going to talk. No, no, don't no. That's actually not yet. true, Matt. No, because mm -hmm. we were not contacted really? and have not been in contact with this person. Therefore, they cannot <coughs> sign a privacy waiver to allow us to talk about their case. Yeah, it, but it, <laughs> you don't know anything about the case. That's what I said. We, we're aware of press reports. Well, don't say it's because of privacy reasons that you can't say anything about it. I said we have no further information about it. Well, you don't have any information about it because you weren't contacted. Except for the press reports, correct? Yes. So, all right, that, that's just good. By line. Yeah. Well, can I? I've got another one that's going to involve the privacy. Okay. Uh, do you know? Um, I'll go to you next. What happened? Uh, I've got three. Two of which have to do with pri may have to Should do I with the Privacy to Act. One is um, this family from Northern Arizona that was rescued at sea. Mm -hmm. Um, and they ended up in Chile, and I understand that the U.S. that the embassy in Santiago ar helped arrange for them to get back to the state. I'm just wondering, mm -hmm. have they gotten back? To the, have they left Chile to, your, to the best of your knowledge? Uh, I, again, we've seen those press reports. Uh, the U.S. embassy in Santiago did provide consular assistance. Yeah. Uh, here we go. Due to privacy considerations, we cannot provide further details. Do you know whether the family will have to repay? All of the governments involved, Venezuela, Chile, and the U.S., can were you, uh, basically saving them. I don't have any further details for you. Um, can, can you just explain what it is in the Pri Privacy Act that prohibits you saying whether or not it's your understanding that they're still in Chile or whether they have left? Dustin, I don't, you're not even asking for their destination. I just want to know well, if they're still It's my still understanding in that Chile. unless we have a Privacy Act waiver, uh, that we cannot provide any information uh, beyond what's in the press and beyond saying that we provided or did not provide consular assistance. Are you able to say whether anything that uh, they have said to reporters is accurate or inaccurate? I am in no way able to provide any further details other than what I've already said. Uh, the American in, uh, imprisoned in North Korea, mm -hmm. Mr. Kenneth Bay. Yep. Do you have an uh, update on his situation? I do. And remind me that he signed a Privacy Act waiver when he was in a North Korean prison, is that I, correct? Yes, we do. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so clearly there's no greater priority for us than the welfare and safety of citizens abroad. Uh, we continue to urge uh, the DPRK authorities to grant Mr. Bay amnest amnesty and immediate release. Uh, the Embassy of Sweden in Pyongyang, which serves as the U.S. protecting power in North Korea, was granted a seventh consular visit on August 9th at a hospital in Pyongyang. Uh, this is the first visit since May when he was visited in prison. Uh, it's clear that Mr. Bay's health is deteriorating. We've deteriorating, excuse me. We've been concerned about his health for a long time uh, and is of deep concern to us today. Uh, we are in regular communication with the Embassy of Sweden in Pyongyang about Mr. Bay's case and we remain in close contact with his family. You have in there when he signed the Privacy Act waiver? I do not. Um, then just back on the Chile one, do you can can you say affirmatively that this family was given the opportunity to sign a Privacy Act waiver, or is that covered by the Privacy Act? I, I, well? I don't have that in front of me. I don't know the answer, but I, I can, assume it's standard procedure. But I don't want to say that definitively out? in this case. It's allegedly standard procedure, but I have deep suspicions about it. I will take your deep suspicion uh, into account, deep and concerns. I will try and find Serious out. Serious concerns. Serious concerns. Absolutely. No, I was going to ask about Mr. Bay, but oh. do you have any kind of readout on how ill he is? Uh, I, I don't have any more specifics about his health condition. We do know it's been deteriorating um, and that he is uh, now in a hospital. But again, uh, we will continue to urge the DPRK uh, to grant him amnesty and immediate release uh, so he can return home. I have one more very brief one. Okay, but, and then one in the back. Go ahead, go oh, back. Go ahead. 
Okay, on Secretary Kerry's South America trip. Mm -hmm. uh, I was how, wondering when we were going to get yes, there. Yes. Uh, how, yeah. are, how are concerns uh, over that have been expressed by South American nations over the uh, NSA surveillance programs, how are those playing into his trip? Um, and also, mm -hmm. can, you, can you touch on the scope of the concerns expressed by the international community? How many countries uh, have, you know, tried to talk to, to Kerry or other U.S. officials uh, about the extent mm -hmm. of the surveillance? Well, let me say a few words about his trip, and then I will answer your questions about the NSA issues as well. Uh, he, the secretary is currently in Bogota. Uh, tomorrow, he will go to Brazil. Uh, in both of these places, he is working to further cooperation and dialogue with important regional partners. He arrived in Bogota last night. Uh, he meets today in Bogota with Colombian President Santos and Foreign Minister Olguin to discuss our robust bilateral partnership. He will also meet with the Defense Minister to highlight the importance of the U.S.-Columbia counter-narcotics partnership and discuss regional security cooperation. Uh, in support of the Colombian government's peace efforts, uh, the Secretary met today with Colombian peace negotiators and attended an event for wounded and disabled Colombian veterans and civilians. Uh, he will travel to Brasilia uh, tomorrow, and we can talk about that a little more tomorrow. Uh, obviously, he's discussing a wide range of issues. Our relationships involve everything from trade, of course, in Colombia with the free trade agreement, uh, counter-narcotics, uh, other security issues of mutual concern. Uh, and we've been clear that we'll continue discussing uh, with our partners uh, through diplomatic channels uh, the issues that have been raised by some of the NSA disclosures. Uh, we're not obviously going to comment publicly on what those discussions always look like, uh, other than to say that as a matter of policy, we've been clear that the U.S. gathers foreign intelligence of the type gathered by all nations, that it's based in law, uh, and it's subject to oversight by all three branches of our government. I would also uh, point you to the comments the President made on Friday, pledging increased transparency uh, and public discussion uh, of these programs going forward. He talked a lot about this in his press conference and also released some new information about additional oversight. So these will be part of the discussion, of course, but in no way overshadow the important uh, work we have to do with both countries on the economic and security uh, and diplomatic fronts. And what about other countries that have expressed mm -hmm. concerns? Can you, can you talk about, you know, sort of the scope, the extent? I don't have a full list of, of the countries that have expressed concerns, but we've made clear to all of our, anyone who's raised a concern, any country, uh, that we, again, gather intelligence of the kind that's gathered by many nations, that it's rooted in law, that it has strong oversight, and that uh, we believe it's important that this discussion, uh, while in and of itself is important, but it shouldn't detract from the broad bilateral relationships we have around the world with a variety of countries uh, that we work with both on security cooperation, uh, but on a host of other uh, issues as well. One of the things the President mentioned mm -hmm. in his press conference about this was that it is not good enough for him just to be satisfied that mm -hmm. this is so why should and to, and and that and that other people that, that these additional steps need to be should be taken mm -hmm. to improve people's confidence? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, so why should a foreign country believe you if the president himself says, amidst allows that the American people aren't uh, that it's not enough just for him to think that it's okay? Uh, how can how can how how exactly is it when the president says something like this? that you can go to a foreign country and say that this is rooted in law mm -hmm. and has strong oversight when the president himself said that the, the, that the roots in law and the, and the, and the mm -hmm. strong oversight isn't good enough. Well, those because two it's things not, aren't mutually exclusive, Matt. We have been making the same... If they're not good enough for him, why should they be good enough for other countries? <laughs> he was making those comments in the context of the fact that going forward we are going to be taking additional steps to increase transparency about these programs right. and that's why we've been engaging at very high levels diplomatically uh, when other countries have raised concerns with us. Yeah, but why, why should they, <laughs> if he himself says that it's not enough and that these additional steps have to be taken, how is it that it should be good enough for a foreign country to accept your assurances about things that have been done prior to Friday or well, prior would, to these new reforms being enacted. Right. Well, I would say two things. Needless to say, our, our diplomatic conversations with other countries about these programs go beyond, you know, a top line, we have oversight and it's rooted in law. I would hope so. so but why should they believe you in those two things if the president himself says that he's not, that it's not enough for him just to know this? Well, there, there's, diff there's a difference between a diplomatic private conversation we have about these issues, which we've had with a number of countries, okay. and the need and the desire of the administration to make increased information available to the public. Those are two different things. So, uh, we've the had public, so the American public isn't worthy or deserving of 
the same kind of explanations that you give foreign governments? I would actually say the opposite. The president oh, okay. made very clear on Friday right. uh, that so we are going to continue to talk about this publicly, increase transparency. Okay. We've been uh, open and, and honest and upfront with our foreign counterparts when they raise the issue, and we're going to keep sharing as much as we can and be even more transparent where we can going forward, both with the public and with our foreign counterparts. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, my last one is very brief. Do you have anything on Cambodia and their suspension of military cooperation with the United States I and do. apparently some other countries? Following the elections, uh, the Cambodian Ministry of Defense postponed or canceled a number of international military programs, including with the United States. Uh, we would not cater categorize the cancellation of programs as a suspension of military ties. We haven't indicated uh, that we would suspend military ties. Uh, this was uh, I believe, again, I don't have a lot of details on it, but a suspension or cancellation of uh, some specific programs. Do you know which which American programs are affected by their move? I don't know that. No, I can endeavor can, to can get more information and share it if I can. Uh, I just don't have that in front of me. Uh, and also, you, you said that you hadn't, this is not something coming from the U.S. side. This is something they did mm -hmm. unilaterally. Mm -hmm. Was there not any discussion beforehand with the Cambodians about uh, the possible suspension or possible... I don't know that. I, I, I don't know if there were any discussions. I'm happy to look into it. Before, uh, we, before, before, before the election, basically, and if the election goes poorly, then there might be some consequences. I, I, I'm not aware of any. I can look into it. I just don't know the answer. And if there's uh, something additional to share, I'll get... Do you, are, are, are you disappointed in this move? Do you think that it's a, it's a bad thing? Well, again, we uh, are kind of waiting to see what happens next. We don't view this as a suspension of the overall uh, military ties or relationship. We haven't indicated that's something we want. So this is obviously in the context of the National Election Committee announcing some preliminary results. So we're going to keep watching the process as it unfolds and uh, see where we go from here. Would you like them to reverse their decision? Would you like to have this cooperation back? I, I, I'm not going to hypothetically um, say whether or not we're going to be raising this with them. I'm not aware of us having having uh, raised this with them specifically, but I'm happy to look into okay, it and get I more details. I don't understand how that's hypothetical at all. I will endeavor to get more details for you on this one. Yes. On uh, Mali's presidential election, mm -hmm. uh, what's the U.S. take on the runoff, and also what's being planned in terms of resuming direct cooperation or assistance to Mali mm -hmm. when the new government is in place? Absolutely. So uh, despite heavy rains, Malians took to the polls in large numbers yesterday to peacefully cast their vote for the next president of Mali. We commend the Malian people for their enthusiasm and engagement in this election. The United States congratulates the interim government for securing a peaceful and orderly environment in which Malians were able to vote. We understand that many of the logistical challenges from the first round were overcome for Sunday's second round. Uh, we now call on the candidates and their parties to show patience as vote tabulation continues and to refer any electoral disputes to their constitutional court. Um, we are eager to see Mali move beyond its transitional phase uh, to begin the process of national reconciliation. Uh, in terms of the, I think you were referring to the coup restrictions, uh, we've made clear that following the return of a democratically elected government, uh, we will seek to normalize our foreign assistance to Mali. Uh, these programs will be reviewed and revised to assess the security and development needs in the light of the new environment. Uh, I do understand there are still some procedural issues to be worked out with vote tabulation, so I don't want to get ahead of the process here, but certainly our goal is if this is determined to be a democratically elected a government that's returning to office, that we will move forward lifting those restrictions. You're not going to determine that you don't actually need to make a determination on whether there's a – you might save some money if you don't make the determination. I will take that uh, I want to know if Matt, the third way – Let the our third, people here know that you've suggested that is an option. The unprecedented third option, yes, to, to not I'll make sure everyone knows you think that's an option in this case. Thank um, you. Oh, wait. Zimbabwe, on Zimbabwe, has there been any communication um, to the government, um, uh, Robert Mugabe? We know that the MDC mm -hmm. opposition has uh, made an appeal, but has there been any kind of formal? Not that I know of. I don't, I don't have an update on that for you. I, I can check in with our folks and see if there's anything additional to share. Thanks, everyone.